Good morning to everyone. Are we ready to start? Yes, Madam yes. President. Good morning. We are. You're ready and you're ready to. Y yes, Good. we are ready. Excellent. And Mr. Williams is ready too. Good. Uh, is there anything we need to raise before we start with the examination of Mr. Williams? No, thank no. you. No housekeeping matters. N not no, on your no, side you, yes. either. Excellent. Uh, then we'll get to your examination, Mr. Williams. For uh, the record, can you confirm that you're Richard Williams? Confirmed. It, it shows we're on. Is it better now? Yeah. Yeah, so let me start again. Apologies. Um, for the record, can you confirm that you're Richard Williams? I can confirm that I'm Richard Williams. You are... CEO of Winshear since 2004. That's correct. You're also a director of BTL. Correct. And you are currently CEO of Cornish Metals since September 2015. That is also correct. Uh, you have provided us with two uh, written witness statements. The first one was dated 1st of July 2021 and the second one 3rd of August 2022. Yes, that's correct. Fine. You heard as a witness, as a witness you're under a duty to tell us the truth. There is, I hope there is a witness declaration in front of you. Please read it aloud into the record. I solemnly declare upon my honor and conscience that I shall speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Thank you. So the uh, claimant's uh, counsel will start ask f some introductory questions, and then we go uh, to the respondent's counsel, and the tribunal will probably ask its questions rather at the end, because okay. experience shows that if you wait, the, the answers come in any event. And, uh, or if once in a while, we may ask for a clarification as we are going uh, along. Can I give the floor to uh, Clement's counsel, whose proceeding was this direct? Yes, I'll hand over to Mr. Barrier. Yes, Mr. Barrier, please. Thank you, Madam President. I think the witness does not have his uh, witness statements. We can- He should that. have his unannotated uh, statements, absolutely. Okay. Do you have yes. it there? Yes. Good. Well, in, in that case, we're happy to proceed, and we do not have questions on direct examination, so we're happy to hand over to our colleagues. Fine. Then, uh, uh, are uh, you going to proceed, Mr. Brandenburg? Yes. Uh, good morning, uh, members of the Tribunal and uh, Madam President. Uh, do, do you please. know what? I'm, I'm a little bothered by the screen because I don't see your face and I like to oh. see the faces of people. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh, can we just move it a little bit or will it disturb you? It's fixed. Oh, no, I, I mean, not much. Yes. Do you still see? No, that's, that yeah. might be too much because you... Oh. But are you not bothered by the fact that the, you don't have the screen close to you? You don't need to look uh, at the no, screen? No, no. I've been uh, watching it from far. No problem. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Fine. Yes. Uh, Mr. Richard David Williams. Good morning. Morning. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. Uh, please, uh, can you speak uh, louder so that you can hear? I'm, I'm very good, thank you. Yes, uh, me and uh, my colleague will be asking some questions, and these are questions relating to your own witness statement, Litten. Yep. You have two witness statements with you, right? That's correct. Yes, some questions will be requiring you to answer either yes or no, and please, uh, because we have a very limited time, uh, be precisely, okay? Yes, uh, to start with, I just want to confirm from your own uh, statement. You have your own statement, first written statement of 1st July 2021 with you, right? I do. Yes, please go to last page. Wh sorry, which page? The last one on declaration. Uh, correct, okay. You see it? 
Yes. You say this uh, witness statement has been drafted by me and by Lalif, counsel for the claimant. You see those words? I do. And if we go to the same witness statement, paragraph five. Uh, which page, please? This is uh, page four. Yes, you say that unless uh, specified otherwise, facts referred to in this statement are known by me personally and are true. If they are not known to me personally, confirmed that they are true, based on my knowledge and belief and based on the information available to me, and the source of this information is specified in this statement. You see those words? I do. And uh, before I ask you uh, on your own declaration, referring to the statement that is written by you and your counsel, so please uh, tell the tribunal which, part, uh, which paragraph in this statement uh, you wrote by yourself and which one was written by Ralif. All of this statement is my recollection of the facts working with Lalive as counsel. All of the statements is yours? That's correct. All of this is my knowledge of our time in Tanzania. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. And uh, you told before the tribunal here that you are the CEO of the claimant, Winsha, right? Uh, that is correct. And you, in your CVs, uh, it appears that you also hold various positions in uh, mining companies. I am also, as uh, Madam President pointed out, the CEO of Cornish Meadows. Mm -hmm. In Tanzania, which other companies you are the director? Uh, Bafex Tanzania Limited. Only Bafex? That's correct. In Namibia? Bafex Exploration Limited, but we no longer have that company. So I'm not involved with that company any longer. In Mexico? Uh, nothing. In China? Uh, no, nothing to do with China. In Canada, apart from Winshire? Uh, in Canada, I'm obviously a director of Winshire, uh, uh -huh. a director of Cornish Metals as the CEO. And I also have my own consulting company, which is pretty much defunct, called RDW Consulting. And as a director of... Uh Winshire, sorry, CEO of Winshire, as well as the director of uh, Buffex Tanzania Limited. Uh, let me ask you, how often were you working with the Buffex in Tanzania? Between 2001, when myself and Chris McKenzie formed uh, the original company, Buffex Exploration in, in Namibia, and 2004, where we took the company public uh, on the TSX Venture Exchange. I worked full-time uh, with Helio Resource Corp uh, right up until uh, 2015 when I split my time between Cornish Metals and Helio Resource Corp. And at that time also you were the director of other companies in the world, right? I'm trying to think which other companies they might have been. Um, I worked as a consultant with Sargold Exploration in, in Sardinia. I was not a director there. Um, when we formed the company before we went public, in, between 2001 and 2004, uh, I worked as a consultant, um, but I was not a director of any of the companies that I worked with at that point. Do you I know? I, I did become a consultant with, a, uh, sorry, a director with a company called uh, Rock Ridge capital in West Africa uh, for about two years. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Tanzania, uh, the director, do you know 
the law called Companies Act 2012. You know that law? The Company Act 2012. I, I'm aware of it. I wouldn't say I know it in detail. You are aware. And it regulates the companies, right? Pardon me? Sorry. It regulates uh, affairs of the companies. Okay. You were the director. Of FX Tanzania Limited. Who appointed you? The shareholders. Who are the shareholders of Bafex Tanzania? Helio Resource Corp and Bafex Holdings Limited. Who owns uh, Aerial? The shareholders. Who are they? We have multiple shareholders as a public company. Uh, there are potentially thousands of shareholders. I understand it was you and Mackenzie who established Bafex Holding, right? We have the responsibility as management of the company to look after the affairs of the company and work on behalf of the shareholders. Where are you accounting? Where am I? Where are you accounting as uh, directors? I, I'm, I'm not sure I understand the question. Sorry. I'm asking where are you accounting? Where are you responsible as uh, uh, directors? Whether, is the question whether the directors are accountable? Yes, and the responsible. To whom are you accountable as director of a company? So we're accountable to the shareholders. To shareholders? Correct. Okay, and uh, in Tanzania, who was the chief executive officer of the Bafex? We did not have a chief ex executive officer of Bafex. We had directors, which were myself and Chris McKenzie. Uh, we had a country manager uh, that operated, uh, managed the day-to-day -day operations at the Sasa Gold Project, but we did not have a formal CEO of the company. So you want to tell the tribunal here that uh, there was no any officer operating in Tanzania? Can I just ask a clarification, if you don't mind? Were you executive directors? Uh, that's correct, yes. You are the executive director? We made all of the decisions on behalf of Bafex Tanzania. Uh, please, uh, just tell us, you were the executive director or you were the director for the company? Under the classification executive director. Executive director. And I understand that executive director is responsible for day-to-day -day management of the company, right? The way our company was organized was that Chris McKenzie, who was my business partner, mm -hmm. uh, would run the operations in Tanzania. And my job on the greater part of the company with Helio was to represent the company to investors, shareholders, and also represent Tanzania as a place to do business to, to investors and shareholders. Who was uh, employing employees in Tanzania? Uh, Chris McKenzie was responsible for hiring our country manager, geologist, training field staff. Was he the chief executive officer of Bafex? We were partners. We would confer together and make decisions together. Would you agree with me that in Tanzania you had no any officer, responsible officer, to manage the company day to day? As stated, myself and Chris were executive directors, so we were responsible for the decision making. Were you employed in Tanzania? I had no employment in Tanzania. I had no income, and that has been stated in my witness statement. Did you had any work permit in Tanzania? When I came into the country, I had invitation letters from Bafex Tanzania, which were stamped and visas issued on entry into Tanzania. Have you? Have any document that show that you had uh, any invitation coming or going from and to in Tanzania? I've got the letters from Bafex Tanzania that were supported on entry into Tanzania. Are they with you in your statement? I don't believe so. Are they part of your own written statement? No. No. So will you agree with me that you are not, you are not working in Tanzania? Uh, no, I do not agree with that. You don't agree. If there is no any record to show that you were in Tanzania and someone invested, uh, invited you in Tanzania, that light to say you are not involved in any activities in Tanzania? I'm not sure how to answer that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as an executive director, we were responsible for the affairs of the company. And when I came into the country, I was issued a visa on entry. 
based on letters that I had from Bafex Tanzania to come in to do some work. Uh, Mr. Richard Williams, let me uh, ask you another question. Before you said here that you were the one who was managing affairs in Tanzania, and now you are trying to twist your statement saying that Bafex was inviting you in Tanzania. Who was really inviting you in Tanzania? If at all you were the chief executive officer or you were the director in Tanzania. I'm sorry, I'm not sure that's what Mr. Williams said. You, you represent... Someone's switching off my microphone in the back because I always leave it open so I can jump in. Uh, no, um, I understand that you were uh, executive director, so you had executive responsibilities, but you were also sitting on the board of the company. Is that correct? Correct. You went to Tanzania on regular uh, regular intervals? It would probably be two, three, four times per year. Yeah. And when you went, you had an invitation signed by whom? By the country manager? Yeah, to, to gain entry into the country, you needed an invitation to conduct business. So yes. I would attend with a letter from Bafax Tanzania, which you would um, present on entry into Tanzania and you'd pay a visa entry fee, which is all recorded um, on entry. Um, and and that invitation would be prepared by, by the, company. the country but, manager? Yeah, by the company, by Bafex Tanzania. That was the yeah, But I mean, s someone must do it. It's yeah, the it, company, it, it's yeah, it, on company letterhead, I suppose, yes. but someone signs it? Yeah, it would have been Chris McKenzie or Mike Ashley, the country manager. Good. Does that clarify the position? Uh, the still I have another question. Uh, Mr. Uh, Richard, you are acting in two positions, as director sitting in the board, right? Correct. And at the same time, you are the chief executive director, right? By your own statement. Correct. Correct. And now I'm asking you, who was preparing a letter inviting you to Tanzania? Uh, it seems to me that Mr. William has, has I, I answered this. It was a letter uh, from BTL, from Buffex, uh, no. and it was signed by the country manager or Mr. The, McKenzie. Who was he by name? Who was he by name? Christopher, Christopher McKenzie. Christopher McKenzie. Uh, the country manager was someone else. If I'm, I mean, I'm Mike not Ashley the, the was witness, the. Mike Ashley sorry, was the. I think. Sorry. I'm sorry, I'm not the witness, but I think I understood you before to say that the country manager was not Mr. McKenzie, but someone else. That's correct, uh, Madam President. So Chris McKenzie was my business partner, director, and Michael Ashley was the country manager. Yes, uh, uh, sorry. It's okay. Mr. Richard, uh, have you gone through the statement of uh, McKenzie? I've read it. But you have read it. Yeah. Have you uh, at least know before his law? His law in Tanzania. Uh, I'm his not position can, in Tanzania. Can you clarify the question? Because I'm, I'm asking through the statement of Mackenzie, did you uh, see any law? relating to his engagement in Tanzania? Any? His, his duty, duties in Tanzania. He was a director. He was the director, like you. Yes, correct. You were sitting in the board together. Yes. So he was not chief executive director, nor was he a country director, right? I said we did not have a chief executive director. And he was also in Namibia, right? Well, we had operations in Namibia and Tanzania. Has Mr. McKenzie had any contract in Tanzania? Was he employed in Tanzania? 
he was employed by Helio Resource Corp to act for Helio in Tanzania through Bafex Tanzania Limited. So he was employed in uh, Canada, right? I haven't got his employment agreement in front of me. There was an uh, occasion where he was employed through the UK because that's where he was living. So if he was employed in the UK or in Canada, was he able to invite you to go to Tanzania where he had no contract of employment? I do not know the answer to that. As okay, thank you. Uh, I pass it to my colleague and I will finish later. Please, Andrew. Thank you, Senior Counsel. Uh, good morning, Madam President and honorable members of the tribunal. Good morning, Mr. Williams. Good morning. Um, I'm referring to you, uh, paragraph 46 of your first witness statement. Are you there? Yes. Yes. You stated that in 2009, Helio attracted an important shareholder. That was IFC. Is that correct? That's correct. Which is also a branch of World Bank. Is that correct? Yes. And uh, paragraph 48 of your same statement, you said... IFC invested 6.2 million Canadian dollars. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. And for that money, he got 15% shares in Helio. Is that correct? That's correct. Now, um, did IFC authorize you to open arbitration proceedings? They did not. They did not. Um, can, excuse me, Madam President. Is it sure. possible yes, to expand you can on the it. answer there? Yes. Um, after Tanzania's actions to cancel the retention licenses, the IFC decided to sell its position because they could no longer see an opportunity for the investment. Um, on top of that, they had a, a change in mandate um, in 2007, 2008. The IFC well, prior to 2007, 2008, the IFC typically invested in projects at the construction stage, and they realized that there was an opportunity from 2007, 8 onwards to participate in earlier stage projects like ourselves, which they got involved in. Um, after the market went negative in 2012, and obviously the ability to raise money impacted companies, um, we got to the point where, um, and obviously after Tanzania's situation, the IFC stopped investing in earlier stage projects and started divesting of their interests. And the catalyst for, in our case, was what happened in Tanzania with the retention licenses. So they are no longer a shareholder. Where, where is the proof that they are no longer a shareholder? Was it, not, was it not necessary for you to attach as an exhibit? Uh, it, it, I'm not sure why it would be necessary. Like in a public company, people buy shares and sell shares at their own discretion. Um, in this case, they contacted us and said they wanted to sell their shares, and we arranged for a buyer to buy them. Did, did you have a, a written agreement between yourself, the Helio, and uh, IFC? Did you have an, a written agreement? Uh, an agreement for what? In for investing that uh, 6.2 million and then later on they invested 1.7 Canadian dollars. Yes, there was an investment agreement. Um, when they initially came to the project, they brought a delegation of people including geologists, engineers, uh, social consultants, um, environmental consultants to look at the work that we had conducted uh, to make sure that we met the standards that they required for an investment. And then we went through a whole process of an investment agreement and they had to post online on the IFC website their intention to invest in the company. 
which they did. And there was no opposition at the time from anybody to the investment. And we closed the investment in 2010. Right. Um, so if it happens the, the tribunal rolls in your favor, the Winshire's favor, are you going to apportion the money which was invested by IFC to them? I, I think I understood uh, just for clarification purposes that the IFC is not a shareholder anymore because they sold their shares at a certain time, uh, to 2012 if I remember well. And you will correct me, Mr. Williams, if I misunderstood your testimony. Uh, that is correct. They've sold, they, they are no longer a shareholder. Thank you, Madam President. Um, let me refer you to paragraph 37 of your first witness statement. Yeah. You there? Yes. Yes. In that paragraph, you said you instructed SRK to carry out pair. Is that correct? That is correct. And SRK is a consulting firm, which is known worldwide, right? That is correct. And the pair was prepared on the 12th of September, 2012. Is that correct? That's correct. In the same paragraph, you said, the pair report demonstrated economic viability of the project. Is that correct? It is correct. Can I take you to paragraph five, uh, exhibit C100? Exhibit C100. Um, how do I? It, it is there, right? You see it on the screen. Ah, right, sorry, yes. You have it had copy there as well. And if you want Roman to see three. it in I, paper, I, you have it uh, okay. in the binder as well. Okay. No, I, can, I can see it here. Uh, in that in that uh, uh, page, the the highlighted one. Can you see it? Yes, I can. It says, "SRK notes this assessment is preliminary in nature, and there is no certainty that the preliminary assessment will be realized." It should be noted that mineral resources that are not mineral reserve do not have demonstrated economic viability. So you will agree with me that Pair confirmed that there was no certain that project had mineral reserve. Would you agree with me, according to the SRK report? It is not possible to classify 
mineral reserves in a preliminary economic assessment. That is the rules of um, the 43101 guidelines. To get mineral reserves, you need to complete a feasibility study, and this is not a feasibility study. Did you eventually do did a feasibility study? Uh, as outlined in our application for retention licenses, uh, we were planning to do a feasibility study if the opportunity arose, and it did not. Uh, so we have not completed a feasibility study. So you didn't have a feasibility study? Correct. Was the project economic vi viable without feasibility study? The project was potentially economically viable, which is the whole purpose of a preliminary economic assessment as a step in stone in the development of a mineral exploration project. This is the process through exploration, discovery, evaluation, delineation, and then feasibility, which is what all projects go through. Mr. Williams, can I take you to paragraph 40 of your first witness statement? You have stated that the exploration expenditure recorded in Helios financial statements did not include general corporate overheads. Is that correct? It's correct. Do you know, according to the tax laws in Tanzania, directors are subject to tax? Uh, the directors were not paid, so there was, there was no tax payable. Were you not receiving any remuneration for that? No, zero. And we, we specified that on multiple occasions to the Tanzanian Revenue Authority. And did you know that uh, corporate overheads are subject to tax in Tanzania? I did not. You did not? So you didn't pay corporate taxes in Tanzania? There were no taxes payable because we had no income in the company. It was an exploration company, and we, all of our expenditures were outgoing. We had no revenue uh, in the company. Who was funding the project between Helio and Bafex, Tanzanian Limited? So who was funding it? Who was funding the project uh, between, you, uh, between Helio and Bafex, Tanzania Limited? Uh, my role as CEO was to attend investment conferences and to find investors that were comfortable investing money into Tanzania to advance the SMP Gold Project. And between 2000 and six when we started and 2018 we were very successful in doing that um, as you pointed out earlier we attracted significant shareholders including the ifc which i think was an endorsement of the quality of hmm? not only the project but the quality of the management team just so, sorry miss i just want to know who was funding the project between helio and Bafex? helio resource Co. In your statement, Mr. Williams, you have mentioned that you are issuing shares to investors via private placement. Correct. What, what, what was the arrangement? For example, um, if our share price was 50 cents Canadian dollars per share, um, we would go on a marketing road trip to meet potential investors and we'd outline the merits of the project in Tanzania. Uh, we'd outline what the next phase of work would entail, uh, what the budget would be for that, and we'd get expressions of interest from potential investors about how much they would be prepared to invest and at what price. There are certain rules on the Tanzanian stock, uh, Tanzanian, the Toronto Stock Exchange, which allows a certain discount to your share price. Uh, the maximum discount is 25%. 
Um, so if we were trading at 50 cents, we may do a private placement where we issue shares at 40 cents per share. Um, and sometimes the investors might look for what's called a warrant or a half warrant, which gives them the opportunity to buy additional shares if the share price goes up and the project is successful. Mr. Williams, the money which was collected uh, via private place, was it, were they sent to the project in Tanzania? Was it sent to Tanzania? Uh, a large portion of it was to pay for the exploration in Tanzania, yes. How were you making the transfer? Uh, through our bank accounts in Tanzania, which we no longer have. Did you, do you have the proof for that? Uh, we've submitted the evidence that we do have, and there's also records through the TRA of the applications we submitted for reimbursement of VAT, which was audited by the TRA, uh, approved for reimbursement. Uh, we've been through multiple audits with TRA since we started work in Tanzania. Uh, we've also got records of payments to the NSSF for all of the employees that we have, uh, and invoices, etc. Are those um, private investors um, part of these uh, proceedings, part of this case? Yes, because they're all, whoever's still a shareholder is part of this case. And I think investors uh, who place their faith in, in us as a management team to invest in Tanzania, and in Tanzania as a place to do business, uh, would like to see a positive outcome from this case. So we are acting on behalf of our shareholders. And if I could, uh, I will add that we have not had one shareholder contact us to say that they are not in favor of this process. Thank you, Madam President uh, and honorable members of the tribunal. My senior counsel, Mr. Mandepo, will continue. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Richard, uh, we understand that here we have a case uh, between Winshire and uh, Tanzania, right? Well, it's Winshire, which was formerly Helio Resource Corp. Helio Resources. Yeah. We changed the name after we started the arbitration process. Why did you change the name? I think we needed a, we had a new project in Peru, and we just wanted to give the company a new uh, rebrand. Uh, obviously, it, the company was tarred by our experience in Tanzania. And uh, was the Tanzanian authority aware of that change? We made you aware when we submitted the, um, the notice of intention to proceed to arbitration that we had changed the name from Helio to Winshire. Was there any notice, formal notice, to Tanzania that you have changed the name before filing this arbitration proceedings? Uh, no. No formal notice. Do you know Mining Act? the law which governs uh, mining operations in Tanzania? Yes. And well, the I, Campans I, I, Act, you I said that you know. Sorry. 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 <laughs> Apologies. And the Campans Act, you said that you know it. I'm aware of it. I am not a lawyer, and I don't know it off by heart, but I'm aware of it. Will you agree with me uh, that uh, if there is any change of a name for a company, it was supposed to be by Campans Resolution uh, could, under the Campans Act in Tanzania. Could you maybe show me the uh, section of the Act, please? Uh, want I to show you? Uh, yes, please. Uh, I will show you if you want, but I want to ask you another question. Uh, if well you uh, decided to change the name to Winshire after dispute uh, between you and Tanzania, and you did not inform the authority in Tanzania. Was it fair for you to come here and ask as a windshear payment on the basis of claim by aerial? I think it's 100% fair. Uh, it's fair. the same company with the same shareholders and the same management committee. I was a founder of the company in 2001. I've committed 20 years to this company, uh, regardless of the name. Um, it's been a very difficult period for the company and for myself personally. 
uh, before my friend asks you a uh, uh, question relating to tax payment in Tanzania. Is there any tax paid in Tanzania relating to your operations in Tanzania, as, as far as Buffex Tanzania Limited is concerned? As stated, we paid all of the taxes that were required of us through VAT, NSSF. We had zero revenue, so there were no income taxes payable. Um, we were subject, myself, Chris McKenzie, and Andrew McRitchie, to a, for want of a better term, a fictitious um, assessment by the Tanzanian Revenue Authority, which assessed that because we had not paid any personal tax, uh, the TRA decided that we had paid ourselves 25,000 US dollars each per month uh, for a long period of time, whereas we had actually received nothing. And I think you showed yesterday in the statement the amount of assessment that the TRA has levied against us as a company uh, in regard to that. And we've been through the process multiple times to explain that we weren't paid anything. Um, so if, if that's what you're referring to, um, there is that one aspect which we dispute. And uh, you said that you were paying also NSSF. As I say. That's correct. That's correct. How many employees did you add? It, it varied depending on the level of operations, uh, anywhere up to 30 employees. And we also paid NSSF on any expat uh, geologists that we had in country. And when those expats left the country, we made application to the NSSF for reimbursement, reimbursement of certain funds. And I have to say the NSSF worked extremely efficiently. And when we made such application, it was reimbursed. Who employed them? Because previously you told us there was no any uh, CEO in Tanzania, Chief Executive Officer in Tanzania. As stated, the directors managed directors. the affairs of the company. Who employed them, sorry? Uh, the, the company employed them. Who specifically engaged them in the contract of employment? Well, typically, if it was to do with operations, it would have been Chris McKenzie as the lead, because he managed the operations. He was not an employee in Tanzania, Chris uh, McKenzie. He was a director of the company. He was the director of the company. Were you <laughs> holding any meetings uh, in Tanzania as directors? As directors? Yeah, w when I went to the country to do some work, we had meetings. Is there any record to show that you were accountable or you were holding, uh, hold, holding any meetings? And uh, We've submitted minutes for the director's meetings and they're on file in Tanzania. Are they with you in your statement? Uh, I, I don't have them here, no. So should we believe on your own words that there were meetings in Tanzania? Yes. Yes. And uh, in relation to actual amount you were, you really invested in Tanzania, right. please tell the tribunal how much you invest in Tanzania. The actual in the ground exploration was around 33 million Canadian off the top of my head and the additional costs through overheads, marketing, um, listing costs, audit costs, um, investor relations, traveling, raising money, all of these costs would have been an, an additional $13 million, so around $46 million Canadian dollars. And that figure was by when? That was up until 2019. 2019. Yeah. I take you to Exhibit uh, C-154, this is a letter dated 12th December 2012, you see it? Yep, uh, yes. If you go to second paragraph, the last uh, state, uh, sentence, you see the word? Can you please uh, lead to the tribunal? Yep, the company has spent 23.6 million Canadian dollars. 26, sorry, 20? 23.6. And you said here that you invested 36. 
Well, this is 2012. 2012. This is, this is, this is eight years to go after that. Okay, let me take you to another document. And this is uh, C196. This is a letter dated uh, 15th May 2018. You see it? I do. Scroll down. And I should say, Mr. Williams, when you're shown a document and, and pointed to a specific paragraph or or sentence, if you want to see the context, of course, say so. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. William, you see the third line uh, before last line? You see that? C can you read it? I see your cursor uh -huh. after. Yes. Correct? Yes. I can read that. Read it after a major exploration effort and expenditure of $28 million. $28 million. And this was 2018. 18. So will you agree with me that you are telling us uh, uh, inconsistencies in this uh, tribunal? No, that's a higher number. And if my memory serves me correctly, that was US dollars. Where is the document showing that you invested uh, that amount you spoke to before? It's all in our audited financial statements. Which audited financial statement? Is the Buffett audited financial statement mm -hmm. or Aereo financial statement? Helio resource. Aereo resource. Who was holding retention license? Buffett Tanzania. Buffett Tanzania. And the document I showed you uh, is from Buffett Tanzania. Is it right? It's correct. If Buffett Tanzania, which was owning retention license, said by 2018, by 2018 is where the laws changed. They invested only $28 million. Where are you getting that amount number? We, we, uh, Mr. Williams said before this may be U.S. dollars. So if that is correct, of course, it's not the equivalent of 28 million Canadian dollars. But it's also from our company's financial statements. It's, you know, this is what we've allocated and spent in Tanzania. Uh, Mr. William, there are two differences here. You sent, maybe uh, from stakeholders, you collected a lot of money. But in Tanzania, this is the exploration company, is the accounting to the ministry saying that we invested 20 million US dollars according to their own statement. So will you uh, uh, agree with me that Aereo uh, didn't invest the amount you are trying to say here? Not at all. I think it's fairly clear from our audited financial statements what we did. As a public company, we have to disclose where we spend our money. We have to account for it. and. The focus for our company was the SMP Gold Project in Tanzania. So I'm, I'm, I'm not sure how else you wish me to answer that. Maybe uh, you collected uh, a lot of money to stakeholders, but in Lille, uh, you didn't invest them all in Tanzania, right? Uh, Madam President, if I could just expand a little on the answer here. As you're aware, when we started the company, we had two main assets. One was Namibia, one was Tanzania. In Tanzania, we had one asset, which was the SMP Gold Project. And we as a company made the decision that the SMP Gold Project was the focus for the company. And we ended up divesting of all of our assets in Namibia. So all of the money that we raised was spent and the focus was was Tanzania. And that's reinforced by the fact that when we went into the bear market for resources, um, we actually disposed of the Namibian assets uh, for about $1.2 million to ensure that we kept the Tanzanian asset in good standing. 
And unfortunately for us, the asset that we sold in Namibia is now a multi-million ounce gold, to gold deposit and the people that acquired it um, have a very large valuation in the market. So I think our commitment to Tanzania has been very clearly demonstrated over time. Um, and especially, you know, up until the changes, um, our presence in the country was highly regarded and, and well respected. Um, so to be, to, to be here and asked if we use the money for other purposes is, um, sorry, I, I don't accept that. Yes, uh, let me take you to another document. Uh, uh, so that the tribunal can see the amount you invested in Tanzania. This is the C-158-56. This is a letter dated 12 March 2019. You see it? Yeah. It's addressed to... It's 2018. Sorry, 2018. To sorry. reflect the record. Uh, it's addressed to Honorable Doto Mashaka Biteko. You see it? Deputy Minister. Yes. And uh, down there, who signed it? I did. You signed it? Yes. Right? Uh, can you uh, look to second paragraph and read it, please? Yep. Helio has invested approximately $25 million into the licenses to date. You were the one who wrote this letter. If you take the current exchange rate, $25 million, that equates to close to 33 million Canadian dollars. Approximate. What does the word approximate mean to you? It's pretty close to the right number. Close to. OK. And. Uh, we have a, a claim here of 100, uh, sorry, 20, uh, uh, 83, 86 uh, million US, uh, uh, sorry, million Canadian uh, US, uh, sorry, 124 uh, Canadian US dollars, right? Correct. Correct. What is the basis of that claim from 25 you invested in Tanzania? I think just to clarify the debate, so so your questions are really uh, um, helpful to the tribunal. Um, I understand that these 25 million or the 28 that we saw before yes. are roughly uh, reflective of what we said, what we heard before of the 33. Canadian dollars yes. or even because because of the exchange rate. So these are US dollars, right? Uh, obviously, then there are other items that are added to the actual exploration costs, which we know from, uh, from the submissions and the expert report. But uh, just so that there's no misunderstanding of about what the discussion is. Yes, I, okay. I got it, uh, no, uh, Chairman, uh, President. You know, I, I, to, to answer the Honourable Gentleman's question there, um, I think Ms. Wall will provide detail on how we get from the 46 million Canadian dollar combination of expenditures in Tanzania plus additional costs through um, Helio Resource. Uh, how we get to the 124 million Canadian dollar number, and that's through compounded interest based on audited financial statements from the day we started exploration work in Tanzania up until the day where we feel the projects were expropriated, and right up to uh, interest including up to today. Can I just ask for a clarification, and then I, I give you the floor back, of course, and you will... Uh, yes. uh, Ex excuse the interruption. Um, the, the 25 that are US that are mentioned here are supposed to equate approximately uh, the 33 Canadian that you mentioned before. This is 2018, so it's not 2000 and 
19, then that may be, make it a difference. But uh, in terms of concepts, is that what it is? Meaning that that does not include additional costs such as overhead and raising investments and the like? Correct, and I, if I may just put it into the context that at this time, in 2018, we were trying to engage with Tanzania to find a solution to what had happened to our retention licenses. And you know we hadn't gone through the detailed exercise of cataloging every expense to put together a claim. Um, so you know, the, uh, the ex approximately number there is because at that time we were trying to solve a situation. I'm not sure I got an answer to my question. Is this yeah, so the this would exploration be costs, costs yes. or does it cover the additional costs? Ex exploration costs. Exploration costs. Thank you. Sorry, Mr. Mandepo, you, you should please uh, carry yes, on. Yes, uh, Mr. President. Uh, sorry, Madam President. Yes, uh, you said that uh, uh, expert uh, will uh, give uh, actual cost you are claiming. And you are the chief executive officer of the company, right? Who provided the document to the expert? We provided the audited financial statements to the expert. Which audited financial statement you provided to the expert? Are they, those statements relating to Buffett Tanzania Limited or Erio? Uh, Helio. Helio. Was the Erio company holding any retention in Tanzania, retention license? I think we've understood that the retention licenses were in the name of Bafex Tanzania. Bafex Tanzania. <coughs> and it was Bafex Tanzania which was supposed to claim, because it was the one which is the uh, recognized under the law in Tanzania as an investor, right? But that may be somewhat of a legal question, okay. and I don't think this witness can answer this. Uh, can you maybe yes, you may can let put me it in more practical I will uh, the business terms? Yes. Uh, Mr. William, uh, let me rephrase the question. Uh, Buffett's Tanzania Limited was holding retention license, right? Correct. And Irio according to you, was the one which was funding the project. That is correct. And as a matter of fact, which audited statement was supposed to be a blot uh, to the tribunal to establish the cost? Helio resources. Helio resources. Thank you very much. And in the Mining Act, uh, the company uh, which held a uh, retention license in Tanzania was supposed to comply to certain terms and conditions in the law, right? Correct. And one of them was uh, uh, supposed to file quarterly reports to the Mining Commission. Correct. Correct. Uh, in your recollection, are there any quarterly reports filed with the Mining Commission? 514 that we found, um, of which I think 70% had stamps from Medini, either in Mbeya or in Dar es Salaam. How many of them not stamped? Well, if 70% of them are stamped, 30%. 20%? 30%. 30%. And there are 70% not stamped? No, 70% were stamped were stamped. What does that mean? Some stamps, not, others not stamps? It means that we followed the law uh, because when we went into the country, I think it was very important to us to ensure that we submitted quarterly reports because if we were successful, we did not want to be in the position where we could lose the project through a simple act of not submitting quarterly reports. If I say that uh, those which are not stamps were not received by the authority, would you agree with me? Uh, not at all. What is the justification? There is no reason for us to write a quarterly report and not submit it.
Yes. Uh, you, in your second witness statement, you referred us to the activities which you say they are going on on the project in Tanzania. And uh, you provided some pictures. Uh, these are satellite imagery, That's right? Correct. Who took them? Uh, they were recovered from Google Earth, which is an online um, satellite imagery uh, program. Who uh, specifically uh, recovered them? Uh, I downloaded them from Google you. Earth. You were the one downloaded them? Correct. When was it? Uh, exactly. I'm not sure, but it was around uh, November last year. Uh, and we understand that by the time uh, you downloaded them, uh, it was the, when it already filed this dispute to the tribunal, right? The reason why I downloaded them was just to demonstrate the le level of artisanal mining activity since we had been on the project. But uh, here you are claiming for compensation, that's right. Um, I why do you go and uh, uh, search for the imagery? Are you still owning the project? Uh, the state owns the core of the project, the retention licenses. Are there any other uh, prospecting license you are owning also in Tanzania? There were prospecting licenses that we had, but we have no activity in Tanzania anymore. No activity. But prospecting licenses you have? The prospecting licenses were part of the entire project area. Uh -huh. And the way the exploration process works is that you take the entire area, you do a reconnaissance program where you, you try to assess where within that project area the main targets of interest are for prioritization and follow-up, which we did. And we found multiple areas which we then continued to test between 2007 and 2015, 16, um, which were principally in the retention licenses. But that's not to say that over time, if you did build a mine on the resources that were in the retention license, the peripheral areas which had lower value at this point might not have additional resources on them. We had to focus on what we thought had the best potential to build a resource on. So by the time of uh, revocation of retention licenses, you had some prospecting licenses in existence, right? They were, correct. When they, did they uh, uh, terminated or uh, exp uh, expired? I think from our perspective, the day that the um, government put out the invitation to tender was the day that we lost all value in the project. I'm asking for prospecting, not retention licenses. The whole project had value. But when you take the retention licenses away, you take all of the value. Uh, I, so I, we, we, we had nothing left, effectively. For prospecting licenses, I'm not asking for retention licenses. Okay. You know, as it stood with the information that we had, there was no value in the prospecting licenses without having the retention licenses. Where the revoke, uh, where, where the prospecting license is revoked by law? No. No. Not to my knowledge, no. And how many prospecting licenses do you have? I think it's eight or nine. Eight or nine. Yep. Are they forming part of this dispute? Yes, in my mind, because it's all part of one project. It was one contiguous area that we spent money on to find the resource that ultimately led to the PEA. Do you know the nature of claim before the tribunal? I do. Is it not relating to retention license? It's relating to the abolishment of the retention licenses and the impact it had on the value of our asset in Tanzania, which comprised the whole SMP gold project. If at all prospecting licenses were not terminated or revoked by law, would you claim for prospecting licenses? Our claim is for the damage done to the company and the SMP Gold Project. Do you know Mr. Mark Stanley? I do. He's your friend, right? He was a director also in Bafex, Tanzania. 
And this was, was the one who owning Thorn? Uh, uh, he was the principal in Thorn Tree uh, Mining Limited. Mm -hmm. And we had an agreement with Thorn Tree Limited on two uh, initial prospect and licenses. One was called SAZA, which I believe was PL 2580. And another one we called Saza West, and I don't recall the PL number for that. And then we had three other prospect and licenses, which we optioned from a company called De Harbu Mining. And John Son Casey? That was De Harbu Mining. He was owning De Harbu? De Harbu. And his wife, Lothi? I, I was not aware that his you were wife not aware. was an owner. You didn't participate in the purchasing of the property in Tanzania? I met. Mr. Kessy, I met Mr. Stanley. We had discussions about an agreement, so, yeah. Who signed it? The agreement? Yes. I don't have it in front of me. It was either myself or Chris McKenzie. Okay. Mr. Stanley uh, are requested to provide any testimony before this tribunal? Uh, no. No. Why? It's not necessary. Was the director of the Buffix by then? Look, the, the two principals in the company were myself and Chris McKenzie. But he was participating in the activities in Tanzania, right? Sorry, could you repeat he that? He was participating in Buffix activities in Tanzania he as a director. He was a representative for us in Tanzania, yes. And you once sent him to the minister, right? He offered to help when the whole situation around the abolishment of the retention licenses came to light. Um, we would obviously try to do whatever we could to find a solution to the situation. And, you know, ultimately we never got any answers from the ministry. And if you send him to the minister and you did not choose him to be a witness, would we, would we agree with your statement that you met the minister to discuss on retention? don't have an answer for that. I'm saying you sent Mr. Mark Stanley to meet the minister, mm. right, to discuss on the issues relating to retention licenses, right? Yep. And you were not party to that meeting, right? I trust Mark Stanley. You uh, trust if him. If you are saying that he didn't meet the minister, then I, I don't know what to and say. And I, I asked you before in your statement, that some statement you put there as part were obtained from the third parties and the others were part of your knowledge. Didn't specifically disclose that Mr. Stanley went to meet the minister. Right? Uh, correct. Correct. Why? Well, we, we did allude to the fact that we were trying to engage with the ministry to find a solution, and Mark Stanley was that person. And asked you, why did you, did you not choose Mr. Stanley to be part of witnesses? And it's your friend. Because, as I mentioned, Chris McKenzie and myself were the main people running the company. Do you know that Mr. Stanley is also owning some projects in the same area? Uh, I was not aware of that. I just know that he had the SAZA and SAZA West licenses. And one of our claim here, you are saying that Tanzania waged war against investors, right? Certainly the, the reception that we would have as an investor changed dramatically from 2016 onwards. Was it to you a war? I think to anybody looking in from the outside as an investor, the whole situation that was being projected from Tanzania was very negative. I think the, um, the way that Acacia Mining was being treated sent a very bad signal to the investment community. And any investment meeting that I might have with potential investors, the first questions that would be asked would be, what is happening in Tanzania? Why is Acacia being targeted like this? And it was a very negative perception. So, you know, I'd spent 12 years promoting Tanzania, actually being the face of Tanzania and telling investors that this was a good place to invest. 
and then I had to go and explain to shareholders that I was wrong. Uh, Mr. Lichon, is that a war, according to you? Yes, yes, yes or no? It was a war. Anybody that files a $190 billion fine on a company is, you know, that oh, does I not make any sense. From, from an investor perspective, that's a very, very negative perception to put out as a country. So will you agree with me that you are trying to paint a bad image to Tanzania? Uh, I don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. Why are you saying that is an economic war and you are referring to Akashia? Do you know that Tanzania is now in agreement with Bali to invest and there are continuing investment in Tanzania? I know that um, Acacia Mining was sidelined and Varick came in to negotiate a settlement with the government. Uh, what that agreement entails, I don't know. Um, what I will say is that when you abolish a whole class of licenses, you're basically abolishing the next tier of projects that might become mines in the country. And to become a retention license holder, these are the most advanced projects that are available in the country. And I think the effect it had was to stall development rather than promote development. And who was owning Akasha? You are saying that Akasha was sidelined. Side uh, Barrick was the main share. Barrick was owning. Yeah. And this Barrick, which is in agreement with Tanzania relating to Kabanga, are you aware of that? I am, and as I said, I don't know the terms of the agreement that you reached. Uh, if you don't know, why are you trying to say something you don't know? I didn't say anything I didn't know. Yes. I may end there, Mr. Richard, and then my colleague will proceed from there. Thank you. Yes, I've just got uh, uh, a few questions to ask uh, Mr. Williams. I think and these are just uh, to have a clear understanding. Mr. Williams, we have two companies, uh, Helio Resource and Buffett Tanzania, correct? And you were part of the management of these two companies, right? Correct. Now, let's start with uh, Helio Resources. According to your testimony and the records presented here, Helio Resource used to produce reports, financial uh, reports, right? Uh, we, we always do. Pardon? Uh, not used to, we, we still do. You still do? Yeah. Quarterly and annual reports, right? Uh, if you're talking about financial statements? Yes, yes. Yeah, so the, the quarterly, six-monthly, and three-quarterly financial mm -hmm. statements would be unaudited, okay. and the annual statements would be Will audited. Will be audited. Yeah. So all the annual uh, financial statements for Helio are audited? Correct. On the other hand, you have Buffex Tanzania Limited. Also does the same, right? Do they also have audited financials? We did audit them, and that fed into the Canadian reporting. Okay. So Buffex Tanzania had audited financials, annual audited financials, yep. right? Yeah. Do they also have uh, quarterly reports? I don't recall off the top of my head. But they had, they had uh, uh, quarterly reports filed to the ministry, right? On the, on the financials? Quarterly reports, I, I, not, not financial statements. You overlapped, I lost you. Sorry. <laughs> so the, the quarterly reports we submitted were for the exploration activities that we undertook at the project? Certainly. So my, my question was that uh, did Buffex Tanzania uh, prepare and submit quarterly reports? Right? Yeah, and the expenditures for each license were submitted in those quarterly reports. Yeah. So you would agree with me that these two entities, Buffex and Helio, prepared uh, statements showing the expenditure of the projects in Tanzania. Correct. Correct. So if this tribunal 
wanted to know the actual cost incurred in Tanzania, which will be the source of that information between the two entities. Sorry, are you asking me? I'm saying if I want to know, as an investor, for example, if I want to know the total expenditure in Tanzania, should I go to Buffett's Tanzania Limited or should I go to Helio Resources? Uh, you would go to Helio. Helio. And, yeah, we used, you know, some very senior auditing mm -hmm. companies to do that, PwC. Okay. Uh, we're one of the top audit companies in the world. So does that mean that the audited financials in Tanzania are not reliable? Not at all. Not at all? If they feed into the consolidated audit, audited financial statements. So it would also be correct to say that uh, the figure obtained in Tanzania is the one that is reflected in the financials in the Hirio resource. To the extent that all of the funds expended in Tanzania were recorded in Tanzania, it was, yep. A simple question. If I go to the annual report, financial uh, settlement for Helio, let's say of the year 2015, will I be able to find, will it tally with the figure for Buffex for the same year in terms of the expenditure? I don't have that answer for you because that was compiled by our chief financial officer, Andrew McRitchie. Just common knowledge that if at least source Helio resource we are consolidating, it means the source of the figure will be from Tanzania. Correct. That is correct. So it doesn't matter if one wanted to know the total expenditure, whether you take it from Buffex Tanzania or you take it from Helio resource, it will be the same figure. Well, we've used Helio resource. Pardon? I said we have used Helio Resources audited financials. No, but you are not answering my question. I'm saying the figure for Buffett's Tanzania Limited is the one that is taken to Helio Resource for consolidation. That's we said, yes. That's the accounting process, yes. Yes, so I'm saying the figure for Helio Resource with respect to Tanzania will be similar to the one that is reflected in the audited financials by Buffett. Is that correct? It should be, yes. It should be. Can I ask for a clarification? Yes, I, uh, and we can then pursue this uh, with the expert, of course. <coughs> the BTL audited statements also included the additional costs in respect of um, the Tanzania operations or only the exploration costs and the other costs were on the book of Helio? I'm not sure I, I understand that. Just the costs incurred in Tanzania. So costs not, not incurred the Incurred in Tanzania. Yeah. So if when not, you not travel to a, an investor conference yeah, they, they to promote the investment in Tanzania, this will be on the books of Helio or of PTL? On Helio. On Helio. Right. My apologies. So that means that the figure for the costs w in BTL's financial statements would not be the same like the, the, the ones in Helio's financial statements because part of it would come from BTL and another part would be directly incurred by Helio. Is that correct? Correct. Can I ask a question? Yes, of course. What part, what part of these costs appears on the BTL financial statement that is consolidated then with Helio? So costs incurred directly in country, which would be what? Drilling, labor, okay. assays, transport, food, okay. security. Thank you. So, should I continue? 
Yes, please. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, I should have said. Yeah. So, so Mr. Williams, I, I think members also have asked you uh, a question because this is very important to understand. So, does it mean that after this clarification, that if someone wanted to know the cost of investment in Tanzania, can take the ex the audited financials of uh, Buffex Tanzania Limited plus overheads. Is that what you are saying? That is correct because all of those costs were directly attributable to the work that we were doing in Tanzania. Yes, so I'm saying if I want to get the total figure of investment cost, I take the audited financials from Tanzania, then I add uh, or you apportion the overheads to get a total. Is that correct? No, we would use the Helio Resource Corp Consolidated Financials. Because you are a director of both companies, and you are saying you have two companies. The company in Tanzania has its audited financials, which are transferred to head office at a group level for consolidation. You say that is correct? Yes. So now, the total investment cost is the audited financials of Buffex Tanzania Limited plus overheads. Plus all the costs incurred in Helio for Tanzania. Yes, so those, those included uh, overheads, right? Yep. Okay. Now, you also indicated that uh, directors were never paid. You and Mr. McKenzie, you received zero payment. Is that correct? As directors of Bafex Tanzania Limited, that, that is correct. And what do you mean by zero payment? Well, we had an agreement with Bafex Tanzania where we would provide our services for no, no pay. I was paid as CEO of Helio Resource Corp in Canada, which I paid tax on in Canada. I had no income from BTL. So you were working for free in Tanzania? Correct. So as directors, you were never paid by, uh, by Perfect Tanzania Limited for all the years you operated? Correct. Now, will I be correct as the TRA argued that uh, this was an arrangement for tax avoidance? That's completely incorrect. So with this agreement for you to receive no cost, you had an agreement that you'd never be paid? We, we were never paid by Bifax Tanzania. I'm not sure what else to say. I was paid by Helio Resource Corp. I acted as a director as, as of BTL, and there was no compensation from BTL. So it was an agreement that you receive no compensation? Correct. So now at this stage, if that was the agreement that you did not receive any compensation, why are you claiming overheads at this stage? Because my costs related to attracting investment into Tanzania. Y yes, but why are you claiming overheads now at this stage? I'm, I'm not sure I understand. I'm saying if you had an agreement not to receive any payment, that, that was for me personally. There are costs for travel. Mm -hmm. There are costs to attend conferences, hotels, meals, uh, finance costs, listing costs. Mm -hmm. um, all of these costs are directly attributable to raising the money to spend and invest in Tanzania. So as a director, you have also said that you were a director for Bafex Tanzania, right? Correct. Are you aware that uh, if these overheads were to be charged to Bafex Tanzania, they could have been subject to withholding tax? Uh, not, no, I wasn't. Are you aware that uh, to be subject to withholding tax? Uh, no. No? So would I be correct that uh, if you were made to be aware that these management fees are subject to the holding tax, what would you say? Uh, there were no management fees. 
it's, it's just a nomenclature. Overheads, the other name in Tanzania is management fees. No, the, the overheads comprised a whole spectrum of costs. Yes. Travel, hotel, mm -hmm. investment conferences. All of them, they are called management fees. If they are charged to the subsidiary in Tanzania, they will be subject to tax. You are not aware of that. That would be something that the CFO would have done, but no. Okay. Are you also aware if you were a director and received fees in Tanzania, you would have been subject to tax? I never received any fees in Tanzania. I'm not saying you received, but if you had received. But I didn't. And I would have paid tax in Tanzania. You would have paid tax in Tanzania. Yeah. So would it be correct that uh, the non-payment of fees was with the aim to avoid payment of taxes in Tanzania? No, because I was taxed in Canada. Yes, you wanted to receive your, your director fees in Canada so that you don't pay taxes in Tanzania. I did not receive any director's fees. Okay, let's move to uh, uh, another, another topic and then I will, uh, I will finish in a moment. You have also indicated that you had nine prospecting licenses, is that correct? Correct. And four retention licenses. Correct. So the costs of investment you are claiming includes the cost for both the retention license and the prospecting license. Correct. So it's everything included. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Now, let's go to let's go to uh, paragraph one one twenty three of your first witness statement. So this is a, the Shanta, Shanta Arrangement Agreement. Now, uh, based on uh, 123 to 126, it is your uh, witness statement. Yep. So it is correct that uh, uh, Hirio had entered into an arrangement with with Shanta, right? Correct. Correct. And this agreement was was completed, except for Shanta to uh, uh, implement its obligations under the contract, right? Uh, that's not correct. It, the agreement was not completed uh, because of the abolishment of the retention licenses. We will get to that. I'm just saying, you had signed the agreement, right? Uh, we had signed an agreement. You, you yes. signed the agreement. Correct. Is it part of your, the records of this uh, case? The agreement? Yes, the Shanta agreement. Uh, it's not. It's not? It's not attached as part of evidence here. It's, it's not. But it's not. Now, that agreement, you are saying that it was not complete. Is that what you are saying? Uh, it was terminated. It was terminated. So there was an agreement, a contract between Shanta and Hirio. Which was subject to shareholder approval and approval of the Toronto Stock Exchange. Mm -hmm. Yes. So do you want to tell this tribunal that you had signed this agreement without obtaining the approvals, the necessary approvals? That's part of the process is to sign the agreement, mm -hmm. put out uh, an information circular to shareholders, mm -hmm. 
to gain shareholders' approval. We never had the opportunity to do that because shortly after we had announced the agreement, Tanzania introduced the new laws abolishing retention licenses, and as you can see here, Shanda terminated the agreement. We will get to that. But I'm saying, you, did you sign an agreement without getting your shareholders' approval? Is that what you are saying? I think just to simplify this, I understand that it was signed under the condition that the shareholders and the stock exchange would approve. And Mr. Williams, if I misunderstood no, that, you, that is correct. That's correct. the process, correct. But uh, Mr. President, uh, Madam President, uh, I'm asking a question, and the witness is getting ahead of me, because we want to have an understanding of this issue, so we should be given that opportunity, you see, that opportunity, because I want to understand. I wasn't part of the agreement, and it's not being provided here. So if he's getting ahead of me, I cannot... Uh, Lily, answer my question, please. So I'm saying we wanted to understand. The agreement was terminated. I have not reached to the termination. As between Shanta and, and Helio, everything was complete. That's what I was saying. I want to, to understand, because yes. you are the one that to tell me to understand. Maybe my understanding is wrong, so I, I need to we, understand. Correct. We had reached an agreement. Yes. Uh, can and now, I now ask a clarification because maybe I have misunderstood. Did the agreement say this agreement is conditional upon the approval of the shareholders and of the stock exchange, or did it not say so? No, it did. Yes, they, they were conditions that needed to be satisfied. <laughs> Apologies, Dr. Luinder. But I wasn't clear about Yeah, but I, Madam President, I'm, I'm getting a difficulty here. I don't know. I want to, to understand the witness, but also to understand, for him to understand my question. Because the issue of approval is not part of my, my question. So maybe let me rephrase the question. So was the, the, the contract, the agreement between these two parties terminated because they were not able to obtain approvals from the stock exchange or from the shareholders? No, it was terminated because Tanzania cancelled the retention licenses. Yes, but why did you talk about uh, the approvals by shareholders? Because you asked if I shareholders didn't. had approved. I didn't ask. That is your own formulation. So it was terminated because of the abolishment of retention licenses. So maybe there is something special about shareholders' the approval that we don't know. Maybe you explain here. It is customary as a publicly listed company mm -hmm. that for a transaction such as a merger, mm -hmm. that the majority of shareholders, in this case, I think it was 70% of our shareholders or 70% mm -hmm. of the vote in shareholders mm -hmm. vote in favor of the transaction. So did they give an approval? We never had the opportunity to. So um, the process is such that you sign an agreement mm -hmm. and then you disseminate what's called an information circular to all shareholders, mm -hmm. which is a document that outlines terms of the deal mm -hmm. um, and then asks. So you set a date for a shareholder meeting to vote on the transaction. And we never got to that date because the agreement was terminated by Shankar. So you, you want to, to tell this tribunal that on the side of Helio, uh, the process was not properly done? We, we were in the midst of completing the process. It was being done properly. Mm -hmm. And then Shantar terminated it on the change of the laws in Tanzania. So did Shanta terminate the, the agreement because of those approvals? No, it's because the retention licenses had been but, abolished. But why did you talk about the approvals now? I was explaining what still had to be done to complete the agreement. Now, 
I, I will leave it there, but uh, I, I understand now. Okay, so. Maybe if, if, if you change topic now, I see that we have been going more than an hour and a half, which is quite a long time. And I see the court reporter nodding. So uh, is this a good time for a short break or? I was actually, I could have finished, but oh, uh, let's, take, <laughs> let's take a short break and then we proceed after this. Fine, yeah, then, uh, because I don't want to rush you at the same time. Uh, Mr. Williams, while you understand, uh, you know that you should not uh, speak to anyone. And um, of course, you can go and get a coffee, but uh, the easiest way of handling is, is not to speak at all, because otherwise people do not know what you're speaking about. Understood, Madam President. Good. So uh, should we take 15 minutes now? Good, and we resume in 15 minutes. Good, I think we can uh, resume. Dr. Luende, do you wish to continue your questions? Uh, yes, yes, ma Madam uh, President. So, Mr. Williams, just to refresh your memory, the, the issue we were talking about before we took a short break is with regard to Shanta Oh, Shanta, Shanta Arrangement Agreement and Herio. So when we break, uh, you had indicated that there was uh, an agreement signed by both parties, right? Correct. Now, you have also indicated in your, in your answer that this agreement was terminated, right? Correct. And the reason for termination was the, uh, the new laws passed in Tanzania, is that correct? That is correct. Okay, now, and you agree with that? There was no other explanation provided by Shanda. I'm, I'm just saying, do you agree with that reasoning? Yes. Do you agree that the reason for termination was the, the passage of those laws in Tanzania? That was the reason cited, yes. Now, let's go to Exhibit 100C191. Uh, Paragraph four, let's check. So you, are you aware of this uh, document? Mm -hmm. You know it? Yes. Uh, are you the one who signed it? I am, yes. Now, uh, let's go to this uh, paragraph. Can you, can you read maybe for, for the advantage of the tribunal, that paragraph highlighted there? In Helio's view, the bills do not have a material adverse effect within the meaning of the arrangement agreement mm -hmm. or otherwise under the laws of British Columbia. Mm -hmm. And the arrangement agreement therefore remains in full force and effect. Okay. And you are the one who signed this? Yes. What does that mean? This is statement, it is your statement. Oh. It was our view at the time that in that Chanda could have followed through with the agreement to merge the companies because we were being told that the retention licenses were not being expropriated. So does this say, uh, so by this statement, do, do you mean that uh, the, 
do you agree with Shanta's the reason for, for that, uh, uh, for the termination was the laws? Do you agree with them or you don't agree with them? Our view was that Tanzania was not expropriate in our retention licenses mm -hmm. and that the agreement could be concluded. Our view was ultimately wrong. Okay. Maybe let's go to ARA uh, exhibit ARA 30. Also see your statement there. ARA 30. Now, now let's go to, uh, have, you, have you seen this document? I have, yes. Yes. Now, paragraph, the second paragraph. Richard Williams, you have been quoted there. So based on this uh, quote, what are you saying? You strongly disagree with Shanta's reasoning as an excuse not to implement the agreement. Did you agree with their excuse or you didn't agree based on this one? You disagree with Shanta's assertion, right? Our view was that Tanzania was not expropriate in the retention licenses and we felt that there was an opportunity to conclude the deal. And where, where are those views in this document? Well, we, we don't disclose that in the news release. Hmm? This is just a news release issued by the company to mm -hmm. state our position. Have you disclosed that anywhere in the other documents? This position? Yes. No, this was a news release to shareholders. I'm just saying, in your all documents, have you shown anywhere that that was your understanding? I, I don't have all the documents in front of me, but that was the news release that we published. So if we were to choose now between what you are telling us and what is written here, which one will be the most correct understanding of this? Uh, well, ultimately, Shanta was correct that we did not have any retention licenses and they were right to terminate the agreement. So you were incorrect? Yes. So is this your statement or not your statement? That was my statement at the time. Now it, you disown it. Well, I don't disown it. Mm -hmm. We had, from that period of 2017 until December 2019, every indication from Tanzania that they were not expropriate in the licenses. And in December 2019, the licenses were put out to tender. So I was ultimately wrong. So you, you were wrong, but now, now you are right. I was wrong in that statement. Uh, you were wrong. Did you retract this statement? Did you make any other press release to say you were wrong and now you understand? No. No? No. Okay, so you are, you are, making, you are making it up now. I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not sure what, what you're asking now. No, I'm saying this statement, you are saying that you were wrong at that time. You realized later that you were wrong. I'm asking you, did you put up another statement saying we were wrong in the first statement, now this is the correct position? Well, the only inference from that is that when we initiated No, but the question, the that question is... says we were wrong. <laughs> Mr. Williams, the question is, did you put up another statement saying we were wrong in our September press release now the correct position is this one. Simple question. Uh, we didn't put out a news You didn't, release. yeah. So you did it. Now I will move to, to something else. You have also indicated in your statement about uh, illegal miners, right? Correct. You were the one who took photos about the illegal miners in Tanzania, right? I, I didn't take the photographs. I downloaded them from Google Earth. You, you are okay. Correct. You downloaded the... Now, what is your interest with those uh, illegal miners in Tanzania? It was an opportunity to demonstrate the mm -hmm. proliferation of artisanal mining activity since 2018. 
demonstrating to who? To whoever's interested in what's mm -hmm. happened on the project. But you, you have indicated that uh, uh, Tanzania had expropriated and the licenses had diverted to the government, right? Correct. Why would you have interest then to see whatever is happening there on a property that is not yours? As I said, it's just to demonstrate what's happened on the project with... But it is not your property anymore. Okay. Yes, but why would you be interested with a property that is not yours? I, I'm, no, I'm asking, you have, to, you have to answer to my question. I'm saying, okay, so, so why would you be interested in a property that is not yours? So what, one of the issues that arose after the December 1920 uh, uh, matter was the purported offer of a mining license to us. And what we were looking at was how much of the resource that we'd outlined has now been damaged by artisanal mining uh, to the extent of the environmental impact, the unregulated use of cyanide leach tanks on the project, um, the number of mechanized operations exploiting the resources that we had spent a lot of money exploring and developing. So uh, do you want to tell the tribunal that you wanted to go back to that project? No. Mm -hmm. I think the point from our perspective is that a lot of damage had been done to the work that we had completed between 2006 and 2017 by the influx of artisanal miners that have really impacted and impacted the environment and the resource that we'd outlined. So the interest was the property or the environment? I think everything. I everything? Think, yeah. But the property was not yours anymore. How would you care whether they are illegal miners, they are property that is not yours? As I stated, there was an offer at one point from Tanzania to mm -hmm. apply for a mining license. Offer? Offer to apply for? A mining license. Yeah. Okay. So did you apply for a mining license? We didn't have the information to apply for a mining license. Pardon? We did not have the information to apply for a mining license. You did not have the information to apply for a mining license? Did you apply for any other license? Uh, not since the retention licenses were abolished. I'm asking, after the cancellation of the retention licenses, did you make any uh, application for any other license? One of the indications from Madini was to, again, that Tanzania was not expropriate in the licenses and that we should apply for a prospecting license, which we did and that application was not accepted by Medini. And that was in 2018. 2018, you applied for prospecting license, yep. right? Correct. So if you were given that prospecting license, you could have uh, settled your issues with Tanzania, right? At that point, we had been in discussions or trying to engage the Tanzanian government to confirm whether or not the licenses had been expropriated we were told that one solution was to apply for a prospect in license, which we tried to do, and that application was rejected. I'm asking now, if the application for prospecting license was accepted and you, you were granted that uh, prospecting license, would have solved the dispute with Tanzania? Well, at that time, yes. Yes. Yep. Okay. Now, you have also been asked about uh, IFC. You said uh, they have sold their shares. When did they sell their shares? I believe it was early 2018, if my memory serves me correctly. I had a meeting with IFC delegates at Indaba in Cape Town, mm -hmm. uh, where they informed me of their intention to sell. And how much is taken at the time they were selling their shares? They uh, it, was all, it was all of the shares that they'd acquired at the time. The per, how much percentage? It had been diluted by then, so I, I, the percent, exact percentage I don't know, because since they invested in 2011, uh, we had raised additional funds, 
Um, so they would, their percentage would have been less than 5%. 5%? Uh, that's, my, that's my estimate, yeah. Five, around 5%? Five yeah. And who did they sell to? Uh, it was an investment dealer from Calgary. Investment dealer. Okay. Now, what about uh, Scotia? Scotia is one of the so-called top five banks in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, they led the financing that we did in 2011 that raised $10 million. And there was a number of other institutions that they worked with. And the people that bought the shares in that financing wasn't Scotia, it was other smaller institutional investors. So they mm -hmm. were the lead bank, the salesmen, and the investors were a number of smaller investment firms. So are, are they still the shareholders in Hideo? I, I do not know the answer to that. Okay. So now, uh, who are the major shareholders in Hideo at the moment? Today, uh, yes. Palomina Corp. Mm -hmm. is How much a, stake? 19.99%. Uh, mm -hmm. um, outside of that, it's mainly retail investors that I'm aware of, management, myself. And how, how much shares do you own in Hideo? Yourself as a person or just, through just, you? Just over two million. Two million? Yeah. The percentage? That would be about three, two and a half percent. Three, two and a half percent? Okay. Now, Hideo Resources, how many uh, employees do you have? Today? Yes. Um, really, we have myself, but I don't get paid. Um, Mark Sander, who's the president, he's in the room uh, with us. Uh, we have a, a CFO, Krista Chapman, mm -hmm. and otherwise that's, that's it. We uh, contract uh, workers in Peru for the project we have in Peru, and we pay um, our bookkeeper in Tanzania um, okay. just to, on, an, on, 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 on an as-needed basis. So ar around four, four people, five? And you said also you don't get paid. I don't get paid. So everywhere you work, you don't get paid, right? It's the sacrifice I've had to make. Oh, a sacrifice. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Now, how many subsidiaries does uh, Hirio own globally? Well, as outlined, we have Bafex Holdings mm -hmm. Limited and mm -hmm. Bafex Tanzania Limited. Mm -hmm. And we also have Winshia de Peru, which has some licenses in Peru that we acquired uh, to explore for gold and copper. Okay. Now you, you have Bafex holding, right? Correct. Is it in the operation? It's a holding company. It is? A holding company. A holding company. Okay. Now let's move to something else. You have also indicated that you, you changed the name uh, during the uh, filing of these arbitration, right? Correct. Would it be correct that if I say that the change of name was with the aim of opening these proceedings, right? Uh, it had nothing to do with these proceedings. Pardon? I, I'm not sure what, what, what you mean. We, we changed the name because we had a new project in Peru. Why you did not want to continue the name Hirio? It was just a decision that the company took to rebrand the company. To rebrand the company. Were there any other regulatory issues behind that move? Not at all. Was your image tarnished as Hirio? Uh, my image? No, no, Hirio. Hirio is a company. Your image is still good. You, you, Hirio. <laughs> Hirio. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there were a lot of shareholders who were obviously disgruntled about how things turned out in Tanzania. And it was an opportunity to have a clean start to the project in Peru. So if you wanted to go in Peru with another name, right? Yeah. Okay. But also in the proceedings, you come up with another name. The investor uh, uh, known to Tanzania is Helio, but in the case is Windshare. It's, as I said earlier, it's exactly the same company with the same... So would I be speculative that the change of name aimed at uh, trying to avoid some issues? I'm, unless you specify the issues, I have, I don't, I'm not aware of any issues. I'm just saying if I'm speculative. 
why would you change a name? Uh, uh, you have partners like Tanzania for all those years, and then you suddenly change the name. I think I just explained that. Okay. Something else that we wanted to also understand is with regard to financing of the operations in Tanzania. So you, Hirio would raise money, right? Correct. And then send money to Tanzania, is that correct? Correct. Was there any arrangement between Bafex Tanzania and Hirio uh, as a parent company with regard to funding? Uh, only that any funds sent were non-interest parent. My question is, were there an arrangement? Yes or no? <laughs> there was the arrangement to fund the company and the exploration. So, so you had that arrangement, right? Yeah, there was a subsidiary of ours. We had to fund the I'm program. Saying these are two companies in two different jurisdictions. Um, my, my question is very simple. When you send money to Tanzania, do you have an arrangement between Helio and uh, Bafex Tanzania with regard to that funding? You just keep an account of how much was sent to Tanzania. So hopefully in the future, if you are successful, you can recover that investment. Wait, I'm sorry, when you say arrangement, do you mean a contract? Kind of, yeah. and loan agreement or shareholders agreements, whatever, we, in, in writing. We used to have minutes where we'd convert the funds advan advanced into shares. Okay. So, if we had engage, engaged a drilling company in Tanzania, who would do the, the engagement? Uh, Bafex Tanzania. Bafex Tanzania. Yeah. So, Helio never engaged any uh, expert or a company to do operations in Tanzania? Well, the drilling company itself was operated by a Canadian gentleman mm -hmm. whose name was George, George mm -hmm. Dick. Mm -hmm. uh, the company was called Geological Drilling, mm -hmm. um, but he was an established uh, company in Tanzania and we would pay the bills and all the taxes in Tanzania. So, so I want to know the engagement. Who will engage that drilling company? between Hirio and Bafex Tanzania? I don't, I don't have the agreement at hand. It's not the agreement, Mr. Williams. I'm saying, well, who will engage? Between, you are the director of both companies, please. Bafex, they'll be working for Bafex Tanzania. So the drilling company will be engaged by Bafex Tanzania, yep. right? Yeah. If we had a law firm providing services in Tanzania also, who will, who will engage that, that firm? Well, we, we engaged as both Helio and Bafex Tanzania. So both will be engaging the same company? It was Rex Attorneys, I think. Well, I'm not sure what they called them. But who, who, engaged, who engaged the company? Who engaged the firm? Well, initially it was Helio because we did not have a, Baf a Tanzanian subsidiary. But now we are talking about, uh, we are not talking about uh, before. We are talking of Bafex and Helio. I don't know why you are going to that period here. You are saying we are making comparison between Hirio and Bafex. Now you are talking about before Bafex was incorporated, which I have not said, Mr. Williams. Look, I, I don't have... Why, why would you do that? <laughs> why would you do that? Why would I, sorry, why yes, would I do why that? would you do that? Talk about before Hirio, before Bafex was incorporated, which I have not asked. Well, because there was a period where, we, when we were starting in Tanzania, we yes, didn't but, have a Tanzani um, Tanzanian No, but subsidiary. we are making comparison between Helio and Bafex, Tanzania Limited. So I'm asking, between Bafex and Helio, who engaged the firm? Now you... It would have been 2006. I honestly can't recall. But my, my question is of understanding that you have two companies doing operations in Tanzania. So I want to know those contractors and subcontractors, who engaged them between Bafex and Helio? That's my simple question. With, without the 2006 agreement, I can't, I can't answer that, sorry. 
I'm just saying, when Bafex was incorporated, I'm not talking before it was incorporated. No, when it was incorporated. Pardon? I don't have the paperwork in front of me to see. You the don't need to have plan. them. I'm saying you don't need to have papers. You are a director. This is, should be common knowledge. You have worked for this company for 15 or so years. So you should just know the practice. I'm not asking about the papers. So unless you don't want to tell the tribunal the truth. I cannot recall who engaged the lawyers. You cannot recall. But the drilling company, you said it was Bafex Tanzania, right? Yes. OK. That's to the best of my knowledge. But Chris McKenzie would have been managing the day to day. But in your, in your, in your witness statement, you have indicated somewhere, let's, let's go back to your witness statement. You have indicated that uh, between you and uh, McKenzie, you are the one who was in charge of corporate and administrative affairs. And Mackenzie was in charge of, uh, in charge of uh, uh, the technical aspects. Check it somewhere in one zone. Sorry, I just need to, I'm, I'm wrapping up, so I'll, I'll be done very soon. You have indicated in your witness statement that you were are, you are in charge of corporate affairs, and Mackenzie would have been in charge of uh, the other technical issues. Do you remember that? Sorry, let's go to paragraph 31 of your, of your witness statement. You see? You see where your focus was on corporate side of the business, right? Correct. So you should know better than Eclipse because you are dealing with these corporate issues. You're asking me about operations issues in Tanzania? Yes. Yeah. Chris? You, you were a director in both companies? I was. Yes. Uh, and I've answered that I can't recall who had the engagement, whether it was Healy or Bafex Tanzania, with the lawyers. I, I, I don't have that answer at hand. I can look it up and provide it to you, but I don't have the answer right now. Just uh, the, the last part on uh, the amendments in Tanzania. You, you have been making reference throughout about uh, President Magufuli. You, have you ever met him? No, I have not. You have not. But you have been in Tanzania several times, right? Yes, correct. So your understanding is that Tanzania has Parliament, right? Correct. They, they have the, the judicial system, the court system, right? Correct. And then they also have the presidency. Correct. So in your understanding is that uh, these laws were made by Magufuli, President Magufuli, the amendment to the laws, that was the impression that the investment community had, and that was what was relayed to me personally, but verbally. I don't have any uh, uh, written evidence for that. I'm, I'm asking you as a witness, so your understanding, were those laws made by President Magufuli? I do not know. You do not know. OK. But you understand that in Tanzania there is a parliament. 
I do. You do. Give it to me. Mm -hmm. Something else, uh, you have also indicated that you had engaged expert geologists in your statement, correct, in Tanzania? Uh, of course, yeah, we did over a period of 13 years. I'm saying at one point in time you had employed or engaged uh, expert geologists in Tanzania, right? Expat, you mean? Expat. Correct. Yeah. Do, you re do you recall the names of those uh, experts? The expatriates. There was yes. Mi Michael Ashley. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there was Kermat Noor Mohammed. Uh, uh, Kermat, K I R M A T, Noor Mohammed. Uh, I'd have to go back and pull out all the names now. So what was Mark actually role in Tanzania? His, his title was country manager. Country manager. Was he also a geologist? Correct, yes. OK. And for how long did he work with uh, Buffett Tanzania? I want to say it was five or six years. Five or six years. Yeah. But you did not write a witness statement of Mike Ashley. Uh, he was involved up until, I believe, 2011, before any of this took place. Okay. So he was involved before, but uh, you did not include him in your witness statement, one of the witnesses in this case? Uh, no, we did not. You have also indicated of uh, Mr. Stanley in Tanzania? Stanley? Yes, correct. You, you know him? I do. What was his relationship with Bafex Tanzania? He was a director for a period. Until when? Uh, I haven't got the date off the top of my head, but when the arbitration commenced, he resigned from as a director. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we served notice of the arbitration. So the reason of his resignation is uh, because of the notice to arbitration? It was because of the arbitration. Because of the arbitration. Yeah. Because of why? Because he is based in Tanzania, mm -hmm. and he didn't want to be exposed from a personal perspective to a legal suit between ourselves and Tanzania. Did he tell you that? Yes. Have you indicated it in your witness statement? No. No? No. No. No, OK. Was he a paid director? No. No? So he was just working for free, another sacrifice. He was not paid. He was not paid. For all the years he was a director. His interest was to see the project that we acquired advance to the point where it became a mine. Is he also still a shareholder in, uh, in this uh, in Hirio? I believe so. Um, he hasn't told me that he sold his shares, but like all shareholders, we, the value of those shares from when they were issued to the value today is a, a fraction of what they were. So he's still a shareholder? That's, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer. Okay. Oh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Richard. I think this uh, marks the end on, on my side and my team. So we, we stop here. Thank you, Madam President. Fine. Thank you. Thank you, Madam uh, President. Panel. Mr. Williams, maybe there is a few redirect questions from claimant. Yes, only two questions, Madam President. So Mr. Williams, um, counsel for the respondent, asked you questions about <coughs> the nine prospecting licenses adjacent to the four uh, retention licenses. Do you remember that? Yeah. Uh, could you please tell us what the status of these uh, prospecting licenses here is today? Well, we, we have not submitted, oh, sorry, we, we have not submitted any quarter reports on any of the projects since the abolishment um, and the tender document. Um, so 
my assumption is that they've been cancelled. Uh, could you please give the tribunal a sense of uh, the share these prospecting licenses represented in the overall exploration costs of the project? My, my, my view um, is that everything contributed to the value of the retention licenses. We had to do extensive work across the project as an initial first pass to identify where to focus our activities. And then I would say 90% of all the work that we did subsequently was in the retention licenses because that's where, if off the top of my head, we drilled 70,000 meters of diamond drilling, 50,000 meters of RC drilling. Um, to replicate that today would be about 19 million US dollars. And that was to define the, the resource that we have. Thank you very much, Mr. Williams. No further questions. Thank you. Do my colleagues have questions for Mr. Williams? Yes, you, do you want to start? Thank you, Madam President. Mr. Williams, let me pick up right where Council for Claimant left off. The areas where you conducted exploration work that were not subject to retention licenses. Um, what was the status, uh, not legal status, um, I will, what, what, what were the prospects for those areas at the time the retention licenses were lost? At the time, they were peripheral areas to where we were focused mm -hmm. on advancing the resource from mm -hmm. PEA through pre-feasibility to feasibility study. That's not to say that there wasn't anything in those peripheral mm -hmm. areas. Mm -hmm. And as an example, um, I'll come back to the satellite images that mm -hmm. I provided. There's a, a structure that runs right through the middle of the project area called the Saza Shear Zone, um, which contains high-grade, narrow veins that have got gold mineralization in them. And one of the areas that has now got quite extensive artisanal mining on it is in one of those peripheral areas. So clearly, the artisanal miners have found a high-grade structure which they're mining, which at some point in time we might have found ourselves. And it's typical of exploration projects and mining projects. If you look at our neighbors, Shanta Gold, when they went into production 2013, I think it was, they had a, a reserve of 400,000 ounces of gold. And between 2014 and last year, they'd actually mined 700,000 ounces, almost 800,000 ounces of gold. So through that time, after building the mine, they'd found another, they'd actually mined 700,000 ounces. And their latest reserve statement says they have another 400,000 ounces left. So that's how a mining project evolves. You get a, once you start your first mining area pit, gives you a much better three-dimensional view of the geometry of the ore deposit. And then you can apply that to other areas where you're exploring. But the main focus was to take what you know and get that to the point where you can apply for a mining license and then expand out back into areas where there may be potential, but it wasn't obvious at the time. If I may use, uh, don't let me put words in your mouth, but I want to make sure I understand this. To use an analogy from an industry I'm more familiar with, the oil industry. Uh, oil companies will have an area to explore and they will drill wells in various parts of that area. Right. And some of those wells will indicate there's not commercial oil to be taken from that area. Others will indicate there is. and attention and money will get focused on the areas that seem to not be dry holes, the, the areas that would be useful to exploit. Yep. But to get there, the oil company would have to drill all the wells. Correct. Now, it sounds like your situation is to get to where you were with these four retention areas, exploration in all these areas was at least in your view, necessary. Yeah, you know, when we first 
went into the project, we had an idea of where the mm -hmm. historic mines were. Mm -hmm. So one area that was called Kenge, we knew that there was a mine there. Mm -hmm. um, but nobody had applied really a detailed modern exploration to identify new targets. So that was our first role is to go through that kind of mm -hmm. elimination process. Mm -hmm. So you do a property-wide survey, you do airborne magnetic survey, and it gives you a picture, a structural picture of where the main targets might be. And you see what focuses you in on the obvious targets. And once you've delineated that, then you might go back to some other areas. But the first part is to prioritize where to invest your money. All right. Yeah. That's helpful. Thank you. Now, I'm going to bounce around in some not terribly related subject areas. First, on the Shanta transaction, if you know, I assume you would know, <laughs> were you being offered existing shares in Shanta or new shares that were to be uh, they, they would have, They would have been new shares. New shares. Yep. So the number of shares outstanding would be increased. Correct. Okay. That being the case, how would you know the value of the new shares since the number the, the, the number of shares is being diluted if this area if this were to go forward? You, you would just base it on the share price at the time on the listing. So they would you know that now wh whether the market accepts that, the market mm -hmm. may react mm -hmm. afterwards and, and sell down because you've issued new shares. Okay. Continuing on Shanta for a minute, uh, what changed between June of 2017 and December of 19, ignoring the government action? I assume, not, yeah. assume that Tanzania did nothing here. What changed in that time period that would affect the value of that would affect the value of your operation in Tanzania? It affect the amount that someone would be willing to pay you for it? Well, I think the biggest issue would have been the impact of artisanal miners. So, you know, the influx of miners mining the resource that we'd outlined takes value away from what, takes value away. Mm -hmm. what, what we had spent a lot mm -hmm. of money on. Um, on top of that, there was the concern about the environmental impact, um, you know, the images, photographs that we've seen mm -hmm. show heavy equipment, use of explosives, use of cyanide, um, which all are unregulated. So there's, you know, a, a, a big impact on the environmental side there. Um, and you, you'd effectively have to resurvey all of the areas that we had worked to understand how much of that resource that we'd outlined had been extracted. What about the effect of gold prices? The, the, the gold price had obviously ridden, uh, risen. Um, you know, th this, I, I don't know how much scope I've got here, but this is really the crux of the retention license um, basis is by having the potential for up to 10 years of a retention license gets you through a bear market in resource mm -hmm. prices to the point where with the rise in gold price, you can raise more money again. Well, I'll just ask you your, your, your opinion on this. The gold price, in fact, did go up substantially from the middle of 17 yep. to the end of 19. Yep. Uh, would you expect that even with the other problems you mentioned, the artisanal miners, et cetera, that bidders for your project would have been willing to pay more in 2019 than they would have been willing to pay in the middle of 17? Uh, I, I would expect so. Um, you know, the reference point I would use is the PEA that we did, mm -hmm. where, you know, all of these economic assessments have um, uh, sensitivity analysis mm -hmm. uh, related to changes in metal price. And from the PEA date to, say, today, um, the NPV of the project as it was 
back then would be over 250 million US dollars today on the base case, mm -hmm. and on the upside case would be over 350 million dollars. When you look at those, it is clear that the value of this project is highly sensitive to the price of gold. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Um, moving on to your, the status of Windshear as a junior mining company. I want to make sure we're all working on the same understanding of what a junior mining company is. And let me just simply tell you my understanding, and sure. you tell me what's wrong with that. Okay. My understanding of junior mining companies is that they go into areas that they've identified as hopeful. They do uh, exploration. Uh, they try to demonstrate the existence of a ore reserve but they're not in the business of turning it into an operating mine. That they rather expect to sell what they have found yeah. to a much larger company yeah. that has the wherewithal to yeah. actually run a mine. Yeah. Have I got that roughly right? Yeah. Uh, yes, to a degree. I think there are, you know, I'll, I'll use the example of Tanzania because we're mm -hmm. here to talk about Tanzania. If, if you look at the big mines that are operating today uh -huh. in Tanzania um, and some of the mines that have closed down, Buli and Hulu was, a quite, was mined by Barrick, mm -hmm. but it was mm -hmm. discovered by a junior company mm -hmm. called Sutton Resources. Mm -hmm. um, Tulawaka was bought by Barrick, but it was discovered by mm -hmm. a company called Pangea. Mm -hmm. uh, similarly, Gator, which is now operated by Anglo Gold, was discovered by Clough Resources. Um, so that is that first kind of mm -hmm. model that you talked mm -hmm. about. Typically junior companies will go into areas which are underexplored, mm -hmm. um, obviously takes a bit more risk because the big mining companies, they don't like risk. They will wait. F so the role of the junior company mm -hmm. in the whole sector is to go and find something and then the company mm -hmm. that's got the wherewithal and the capital to build a big mine can come in and mm -hmm. do that. Um, you know, the, there are, but there are exceptions. Um, you know, a good example is in Canada is a company called Osisco Gold Mining. And they went from being a junior company in 2004. Mm -hmm. um, they acquired a project in Quebec for $60,000 in 2004. Between 2005 and 2011, um, they discovered a, I think it's a 16 million ounce gold deposit, and they built Canada's biggest gold mine. And then it was bought by two big mining companies. So they actually took it right through discovery, delineation, feasibility study, and mine construction. Mm -hmm. Okay, that, that, that's con yeah. consistent with, with the sense I had. Um, separate question. The geological data that you acquired and still possess, could that not be sold to someone who took over your operation? Uh, of course. It, I, I think that's, you know, the value of the area mm -hmm. that is there is, you know, nobody would want to come in and have to replicate everything we did. Mm -hmm. um, so the value of the 33 million Canadian that we spent in Tanzania is, is sitting in the courtyard at the office we have in Nkujuni mm -hmm. and on the databases that we have. Mm -hmm. Is there no market for that data? I, I, I don't know who, if anybody bid on the tender process. Mm -hmm. um, Potentially, but it's it's not ours to sell. <laughs> we don't own the licenses, so the data I thought was yours. Well, we, we own the data. But yes, it's, it's not yours to use in the mine. Yes, I understand that. Yeah, <laughs> but if someone did start to work the area that you had explored, yeah, they would have use for this data. I, I'm, they? I'm sure they would. Yes, and for some price, they'd be willing to pay some price for that data. I would expect so. Okay. Um, the IFC sale, um, do you know the price that they received for their shares? I, 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 I'd have to look, but off the top of my head, I think it was 65 cents Canadian. Um, do, do, Okay. How does that compare with the offer you got from Shanta trying converting this into oh, cents um, per share? It would have been 
seven percent. Seven percent of the price that Shant had offered you. Uh, no, the, the the price that Shant had offered us was well below what the IFC paid. Uh, well below what the IFC and the AFC they they bailed out in 2018. How did they get such a high price then in 2018? Well, I, you know, again, when you look at the, we were in a bull market for resources. So, um, what, no, what did they get for it when they sold it? That was or, the price. Or, or, uh, the, it was around about, um, sorry, six or seven cents Canadian. Six I or seven you, thought, cents Canadian. My, my apologies. I thought you'd ask what they paid for it. Oh, no, I'm sorry. No, no. what did they get when they sold yeah, it? it? Yes, it, it, okay. Yeah. And then how does that compare to you know, converting, doing apples to apples, how does that compare to what Shanta was offering you? Uh, it was about the same. About the same, okay. Turning to the Snowden study for a minute, can you tell us just what a desktop review is? And how that compares to a PEA? Uh, it, it's just looking at current costings at the time and looking at different scenarios. So one of, one of the different scenarios there was mining underground, mm -hmm. uh, which we didn't do in the PEA. So it was a different approach of trying to identify some high-grade zones mm -hmm. that would work at a lower gold price um, and mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. the pit smaller mm -hmm. to minimize costs and see what we could maximize from a production scenario on a lower gold price. Now, if you know when organizations like SRK or, or Snowden or anyone else, or you, when you're looking at uh, uh, going into a project, how, in doing your projections, how do you take account of the, shall we say, the high variability of the price of gold over a period of eight to ten years? How do you account for that? in making your projections? You know, you, you typically take um, analysts' projections for mm -hmm. their price forecasts, um, and then the consultants and the experts that come in, they will give you a price that they are comfortable working with for the studies that they're doing. Uh, so it's a combination of, of the consultants and mm -hmm. market forecasts. And they routinely assume a constant price. I notice in both the, the PEA and the uh, desktop study, they assumed a constant price yeah. over the period of the projection. Yeah. yeah. And that's typically the way it's done? It, it is typical. You very, you very rarely, if ever, see um, a factored in rise or drop mm -hmm. in, in the price. You'll take what the forecast price will be and you apply that to the study. Do they ever somehow assume in these studies a cost of hedging that price over time? They would probably do that at the feasibility stage, um, but you know the PEA would probably be a bit too early to do that. Okay. That's all I have, Madam President. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Williams. Thank you. Then my, my co arbitrator has asked virtually all the questions I was going to ask you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me start by following up on the last questions about uh, the gold price uh, evolution and how this impacts uh, your projections. You invested, when you invested in Tanzania, and you will correct me. I understand the gold price were, was about 500 dollars. When we first started, yes. Yeah. And then when we get to 2012, it was considerably higher. And still, we're told that it would not have been economical to develop the mind at this much higher price, which was probably about double. Mm. Uh, I'm not sure I understand how the projections were made and the, how, this ca how can this be? Th there's a lot of factors to consider. Um, 
through that period from 2005 through to 2011-12, you had price growth in pretty much every metal, copper, yeah. gold, lead, zinc, tin, um, but it also coincided with a lot of pressure, price pressure on materials, labour, power, fuel, equipment. Um, you may recall at some point some of the mining operations around the world could not buy spare tyres because there was so much demand for them. So you had inflationary costs at the same time. So even though the gold price was going up, your operating costs were going with it. So it, it's a combination of inflation. Yeah, we would have to look at the inflation figures, but I doubt that uh, uh, over these years, but I very much doubt that this would have doubled the prices. Or would I, it? I, 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 yeah, so we would need to look at this more closely. Yeah. Uh, was was the documentation. Another question uh, is when you, you the first license, uh, the, the SAZA uh, prospecting license you got in 2005 or you decided to buy in 2005, is that yeah, right? We, yeah, correct. And then, uh, at that time, the, the 1998 mining code was in place, which allowed for a th an initial three-year period, then two years, then two years, and possibly two additional years if you have to, uh, you need time to complete the feasibility study. And so, um, I have difficulty understanding why by 2011 you should, according to this, have gotten to, the, the SASA license was issued in 2004, right? You acquired it in 2005. So by 2011, uh, you should have got to the feasibility study seven years later, maybe two additional years. And uh, from looking at the at the record, uh, you have the PEA in 2012, so and that's not a feasibility yep. study. So how come this development did not proceed faster? So we started with one license, and then uh, we were approached by Mr. Cassie of the uh, Harbour, which had three other licenses, and the project became bigger um, and we were finding areas of gold mineralization on the original license plus the licenses that Mr. Cassie brought into the deal. So to complete the PEA required outlining a resource on all four areas to feed into the PEA. Uh, we didn't have enough on the, um, the one license, the SASA license. To, to complete a feasibility study, so we'd extended it for the two years and then applied as a project in the main areas to convert the main areas to retention license. There's another area of the record that I would like your uh, help to better understand. When I look at uh, the 2018 uh, regulations, it, I, it seems to me that the retention licenses were taken away at that time. But somehow your reaction uh, was rather subdued, I would say, in the sense that um, if I compare this, for instance, with the correspondence I find about and the protests about illegal mining, then one gets a feel that there's a lot of activity on your side trying to resolve this issue. I don't have the same impression at all, uh, and maybe I miss things, but at, I don't have the same impression at all of your engagement when the 2018 January regulations were uh, were issued. Well, this should have been a real shock. Should would it not have been? 
all of the indications we were getting through either speaking through the Canadian High Commission um, or through Mark Stanley to people within the Medini, which is the Ministry of yeah. Mines, um, was that the licenses were not being expropriated and when the situation with Acacia was resolved, the turn attention to the retention licenses. So the message we were being relayed was be patient and we'll get to it. And that message continued up until November 2019. Um, so, you know, I, we could have kept, kicked up a fuss, but, you know, it was our opinion that we wanted to work with Tanzania. And in hindsight, it, it didn't work out the way we'd hoped. For instance, uh, th there's, a, there's an exhibit C-356, maybe uh, someone who has control of the screen could show it. Uh, who controls the screen? Maybe the, the, the Clemens Council can, uh, can find it. It's uh, while someone's looking for it. It's uh, an email from Mr. Muturi of the uh, of the TMCE, the Tanzania. Uh, uh, yes, here it is. Uh, Chamber of Minerals and, and Energy, and he writes to you. Uh, that's just after the amending legislation. Uh, that. Well, the understanding is that y your uh, your licenses should be allowed to live their lives, or something like that. Uh, but that you should uh, let me see. I'm looking uh, that, that it's a chain. I would need to look at the uh, 17 July 20. 17 uh, email. This is it, right? Here, do you see it? And then scroll down. Maybe you read it for yourself. Is there a particular section or all of it? No. He. he he says at, uh, that his recommendation is that BTL immediately commence a feasibility study and an EIA process to be followed by the application of a mining license so as to avoid the risk of losing the area. And then if we go up the chain, uh, you're you do not react before uh, January 2018. Mm. And that seemed strange to me considering the content of uh, the, the message that says, I mean, speaks of losing the area. Was, the, was this not reflective of what well, happened uh, then? I think from our perspective, it would have been pretty difficult to justify spending money on a feasibility study when we didn't know if we had the licenses or not. And so the discussions we were having through the Canadian High Commission and Mark Stanley with Medini was what was the status, you know, if, and then we had the indication to apply for a prospecting license, which we did in 2018. If that had been granted, that would have given us the comfort that we could justify spending some money, but they never accepted the application. You know, that's, yeah. that's understandable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what exactly were the areas affected by the illegal mining. I understand it uh, affected Elizabeth Hill, and yep. that's in the Kingi uh, area. 
but what about the others? So, so the main area at that time of the conflict was uh, the Elizabeth Hill area, which represented 30% approximately of the mineral resource that we had. Um, and, you know, we tried to engage, well, it's all documented in the, the statement, but we tried to engage Medini. Um, we tried to engage the regional commissioner, district no, commissioner. No, all of so, this I, yeah. I am aware of. The question is really because when you look at this, uh, uh, these uh, documents, it all they all, if I'm not mistaken, speak about Elizabeth Hill. Yeah, that would, that uh, there was the rest not being mined illegally? There was an area near Porcupine that was being mined illegally, but there, there was quite extensive artisanal mining. But at that time, the intensity of it, for the most part, was fairly small scale. Um, you'd see groups of miners with um, metal detectors, and they would dig pits to look for gold nuggets. Um, so the impact was fairly small. Um, but through time it did increase where there seemed to be an external company that was supplying um, cyanide leach tanks, equipment. Um, they would be driving around in big trucks, buying ore for processing. So it was increasing. But, but the conflict area was Elizabeth Hill. Okay, let me see whether I have other questions that I should you know the question of the prospective licenses have been asked uh, by one of my colleagues and the rest as well so uh, I have no further questions if do the, if the do, if the parties have any additional questions that directly arise from tribunal questions, uh, they may, of course, ask them. Well, one very small clarification, uh, if I may. Uh, Arbitrator Johnson asked you about the core and geological data, and I was wondering how many offers you got for this core and geological data. Uh, none. How many offers to purchase the uh, core? We, we haven't had any offers. Anything on the respondent's side? Dr. Luenda, do you have any uh, question, clarification questions that you would like to ask as, as a result only of the tribunal's questions? Yes, uh, Madam President. My, Please, my, uh, my questions would just be uh, in respect to Shanta and IFC transactions. Just for 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 clarity, I, I did not get the answer on how much uh, how much money uh, IFC earned by sale of their shares. Oh, how was how much was the uh, uh, share purchase price when they they sold their shares from Helio? Uh, let me say what I understood, and you can confirm because we are not going to. I read you the questions. Uh, I got that they were paid at the time when they sold their shares in 2018, six or seven cents. 
Canadian cents. Correct. And about the Shanta transaction, you said it was about the same. Correct. If, if the tribunal allows, I, I could actually find out the information and answer your question. I just need to look at when exactly the trade happened and I can give you an exact amount for what the IFC received. We can, if we need this, then uh, we will uh, ask counsel to, to, to tell yeah. us. Yes, but, uh, but my, my, my question was, I understand it was uh, six or seven cents, but the total amount, because how, how many shares they had, so that we wanted to get the total figure. This is the share price per share, but how much shares they had by that time that's what I wanted the clarity on. Exactly. That's what I offer, offer to provide you. I'll give you that full breakdown of how many shares they had and what they sold them for. Yes, but this is a, it was cross-examination. So we'll appreciate to get it, but it won't be helpful for purposes of now. Uh, but again, you also said that uh, uh, comparatively between uh, the share uh, price that used by IFC and the one by Shanta, they were more or less similar. Is that correct? From my recollection, yes. From my recollection, yes. Okay. So that, that represents basically the market value of the Helios shares. In a, an environment which wasn't really conducive to investment in Tanzania. But the agreement between Shanta and, uh, and the Hirio was concluded before the laws were amended, right? It was in a period. Uh, but you, are, June, you know I'm yes. getting in trouble. You say we have said it, and we need to save the tribunal's time. The Shanta Helio arrangement, was it concluded before the amendments of the laws? It was announced before the amendment, yes. Yes, so the answer is simple, so yes. Dr. Lerwinder, I'm sorry, but this is really uh, an exceptional not uh, opportunity not provided in the rules. If there is any lack of clarity following the tribunal's questions, it's not, it is not an opportunity to make submissions. Of course, you can say later uh, that you, you can make the submission that this was the market price. But uh, Madam President, and uh, I'm sorry to say this, on my side, we, we are not comfortable because as a witness, and you can see, so I think we'll need to find a way to deal with this. Because I'm asking simple questions. I don't get answers. When the tribunal is asking, the witness is responding. Very simple question. And we, we, are, we are lawyers, we have done a practice in different jurisdictions. I'm, I'm sorry, asking, Madam President, I have to object because this is not within the scope of the tribunal's questions earlier. We are going no, way I, beyond I the scope. No, I think this, this is a comment now, so let, let us listen you, to the you comment. See, so, so I think, uh, I think we are getting uncomfortable, and let me say this, uh, the head of this delegation, we, we are just asking uh, normal questions and just to get an answer. For example, I'm asking the witness, was the Shanta transaction before? It's, it's a very simple, straightforward, and the witness is not answering. And then I also get interference from the tribunal for, you know, and I, I think, to be honest, uh, uh, I'm starting to get uncomfortable. So what do you propose? I was just asking a few questions. Let me be given the opportunity to get clarity because as a council representing the government also, there could be some issues that we don't understand from the pleadings. Now we have the witness here to clarify why we are not getting that opportunity. See, simple questions. If we are wrong, maybe we need to be given direction and we are ready to take that. But uh, we, we are here to ensure that there is justice on our side. There is also justice on the investor. So that, that, is a, that is the policy we want. So just to clarify on the issue of Shanta, and I'm asking very simple questions. So if I get the figure, I'm satisfied. And nothing more I would want from my team. 
I can only say that this tribunal is here to provide justice and takes extremely seriously uh, the fact of granting due process to all the two parties. That applies to the claimant and it applies to the respondent. The tribunal operates under certain rules and the procedural rules are that there is direct examination and then there is cross-examination. There is no limitation on the time you wish to spend on this or another witness, except for total time allocation because by the end of the week, the week is over. And so the, your opportunity to ask questions was not restricted. Then there is redirect, and then the tribunal asks its questions. In case exceptionally there is a lack of clarity from a response given to the witness to the tribunal, there's an opportunity to ask for clarification which this tribunal grants as an exception because it's not provided in the rules. And that is the only reason why I tried to uh, shorten this phase that is a phase that is not provided for because we also have time management concerns and the fact, the, the question of the date of the Shanta deal is in the record. It's not something that we need to ask this witness. It's something very easy to check. So that is, that is the, the position, Dr. Luende, and I really wouldn't want you to feel that you don't get your day in court because that would really not be the purpose of this whole proceeding. Madam President, uh, I will take the directives of the tribunal. So I, I won't take it further. I think I will stop here. I would not wish to stop you now if you have another lack of clarity that arises from the tribunal question. Since I have said that you are entitled to do this, you can do it. And I don't want to cut you off. I just want to explain how we operate so that it is clear for everyone and you don't get the feeling that you are not uh, having the opportunity that, sh that is yours. Yes, Madam President, we just wanted, for God's sake, clarity on this Shanta transaction. So I'm asking the witness and then uh, So it's, it's difficult, <laughs> it's difficult on my side, but uh, as you rightly pointed out that some of these uh, information can be found in the pleadings, so we, we will take it that way, that we will be able to, maybe during our, our closing submission, we can submit on some of those issues, but uh, really uh, the conduct of the witness and the way we have been asking questions, we, we have taken issues with that. Fine, so maybe what we should all do is during the lunch break, maybe we can think about how to improve things uh, and the tribunal will do that too so, so that there is this uh, lack of comfort that you expressed uh, can be resolved. Is that an acceptable proposal, Dr. Luende? No, no, we, we will take any direction from the tribunal. We, so we'll we, we are fine because, as I've said, our interest is to make sure that there is justice. That is what we will fight for. So we, we are very comfortable to take the directives from the tribunal, but I, I thought it was also important to say it instead of keeping quiet. So we, we can take, we will do the consultations, no problem, and we take the instructions from the tribunal also. Good. Fine. Then this is a good time for a lunch break, I think. Uh, it might be a little early, but... Uh, 
we can resume. Mr. McKenzie is ready. Yes, he is, Madam President. Do you want to break now? Yeah, maybe that will be good. So let's break now for an hour and resume at 1.15. Uh, and make sure that Mr. McKenzie will then be online. Yes, we can make uh, yeah, that sure. And uh, we will test the connection during the lunch break. Yeah, good. Fine. And then I wish everyone a good lunch. Thank you.